Well, today is a very special day in the life of our church. In fact, we're in the midst of really a couple of very special weekends in the life of our church. Last weekend at the Farmer's Branch campus, we took some time to ordain some new elders there to join the present team of elders there at the Farmer's Branch campus. And we're going to do the same here this weekend at the Vista Ridge campus. But before ordaining them, I want to spend some time in the Word with you uh, about a particular passage and only two verses within it that has so much to tell us about spiritual leadership and what is In these two verses, yes, does speak to uh, the role of being an elder, but it actually speaks to more than just people who might be in that role of leadership for a time in a church. It's actually a broader uh, word it has to leaders of any kind in the family of God, in the work of God, in the kingdom of God globally. And I want you to know this, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, If you're a follower of Jesus, you will have times in your life where you will be a leader. You might not have a a title, you might not have a role, but you will be a leader because Jesus said to all of his disciples in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. Light makes a difference. And something as small as a match that's been struck can make a huge difference in a dark room where there is no other light. And a lot of you live as matches during the week. In fact, the word says in Psalm 104, he makes his servants flames of fire. And some of you are flames of fire in places where there's not much more light. And you're making a difference where you are. So in saying This word about spiritual leadership, don't think you are precluded from this. You're not. If you are a follower of Jesus, this will speak to your life. In fact, I think some of the best leaders aren't even aware they're leading because they're just so focused on following Jesus. In fact, I like to think of them as lead followers. That's really what they are. They're just a lead follower. So uh, I've asked my wife, to give us a little help here. I'm gonna ask Tara to come on up here and join me uh, just for a few moments. I want her to tell you a story that happened to her a few weeks ago that I think is so applicable with where I'm about to head with you about an experience she had at our local gym. I'm so glad you're gonna do this with us. So babe, take it away. Thanks. So about a little over a month ago, I woke up on a Monday morning and I just had this random thought I want to go to a Zumba class today. Now, that was very random. I normally work out in my bedroom every day. Well, not every day, but five days a week, approximately. And, um, but I had not been to, we, I had not been to my local gym since, since COVID. I think I'd gone one time since COVID to our local gym. And previous to that, I had probably not taken a class four years previous to that. So, It had been a long time since I had taken a class, but I just felt like I want to take a class today. Mainly because what was on my app that I normally do in my bedroom was a HIIT workout and I wasn't really looking forward to it. So I'm like- And tell them what a HIIT workout is. Okay, so HIIT is high intensity interval training. And you sweat a lot and it's just not as much fun. So anyway, I just thought Zumba sounds great. So I wake up. I go to the computer and I'm like, I'm gonna see if my gym has a Zumba class today. Get on, it's 8.15, there's one that starts at 8.30. I'm like, babe, there's one that starts at 8.30, I'm gonna go. So I ran and got my workout clothes on real fast because it still was in my pajamas. And, and Chris is like, I'm gonna go with you. I'm like, awesome. So we hop in the car, we head to the gym and we get there, it's after 8.30, so the class has already started, I think, and then the man at the front desk is telling a woman that, sorry, we're not going to have Zumba class today. The instructor didn't show up. And I was like, what? (laughs) Oh my gosh. Like we've gotten up, we've got dressed, we ran over here as fast as we could. And now there's no Zumba class. Now I'm going to have to get on that treadmill or an elliptical. And I don't want to do that. That's boring. And then I didn't bring my AirPods and he's already over on the mountain blaster. So now we're committed to staying. So I'm like, well, maybe they'll let me do my app. 
maybe I could just do my app that I've been doing in my bedroom. Maybe I can just do that in the workout room where the Zumba was going to take place. So I asked the guy, can I go use the room just to do my workout that I normally do at home? And he's like, sure. Well, the lady standing right next to me is like, can I do it with you? And I was like, um, well, sure. And I said, well, it's just on my phone, but yeah, I'm just going to do a hit workout. It's just 30 minutes. Yeah, sure, you can do it with me. She goes, okay, I'm going to go tell my friend. And I'm like, okay. So she walks over to the treadmill, and I'm following her. And she goes over to her friend, who had also come for the Zumba class, and she goes, we have an instructor. And I was like, I I'm not an instructor. I'm not, I'm not an instructor. I'm going to do my hit workout on my phone, I'm just gonna set my phone down on the ground and I'm gonna follow along on the app and you're welcome to do it with me, but I'm not an instructor. And so the girl gets down off the treadmill and they're following me into the, into the workout room and I get in there and I'm starting to set my phone, you know, on the ground and then all these other ladies start walking in. <laughs> Janet Ritchie, one of our new elders' wives, <laughs> thank goodness you were there that day. <laughs> In fact, we have a picture of that, oh, I, I think. Yeah, yeah. Oh, like, there you go. No, no. <laughs> There's Janet right there, right over my shoulder. Thank you for your support, Janet. So we get in there, and y'all, I put my phone against the wall, and I was like, okay, here we go. You can't hear any music. You can't hear anything. And I said, okay, grab some dumbbells, and we're going to do some squats. Okay, well, let's do our squats now. Come on, girls. You know, and... So we, How many of them had streamed in there by now? There were like 12 women <laughs> total, I think, in there. Y'all, I've never worked out so hard in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Janet and I were like, oh my goodness, we couldn't walk right till Friday of that week. <laughs> I had to take a four-hour nap the next day. I had worked out so hard. <laughs> so anyway, I knew while it was happening that it was a God moment. I knew that it was a setup from the Lord because... Chris has talked on um, that's weird moments, or that's what I call them. And it's when you have something that's happening to you and you're like, that's weird. Sometimes I feel like God is tapping us on the shoulder saying, hey, ask me about that. And it's not every time, but this time I was like, okay, Lord, what are you trying to tell me? And so I was processing it later and I knew that it had to do about leadership. And so I have hired a life coach because... In the past little bit, I've been in a place of fear, and I've been trying to move out of that in some areas in my life. And so I was processing this with my life coach, and she said, Tara, how did you feel when you were actually leading this group? And I was like, you know what? It was really empowering. And she said, you know, you made a big deal about telling me all the ways that you weren't prepared, how long it had been since you had been to the gym, how long it had been since you had taken a class. And she said, what if you were actually more prepared than you thought you were? And as I was processing that, I realized literally all I was doing was following someone. And as I was following, people were following me. And I just felt the Lord just kind of give me a nod. That's all you have to do. Follow me. And as you follow me, others may follow you. And it just took the pressure off of me right then and there. And um, I knew it wasn't about me leading a workout class. I knew it was just about me following him and being okay with people following me as I follow him. So. Amen. Thank you, babe. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Now, I'll tell you what I love. And, and, and I will tell you this. I, when I got done doing what I was doing, I'm like, I wonder if Tara's still doing her video, workout, her video workout. I had no idea there were other people in the room. I just snuck around the corner to look through the window and expected to see my wife by herself in there. There were 12 other women behind her following along. And I even love it when you said, I love it when you said, I'm not the instructor. I'm just following the video, you know. She had no idea when she woke up that morning that she was going to be a lead follower. She was just focused on following. 
Now, one of the books I've been spending a lot of time with this fall in our series on hearing God has been the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews has a huge theme about hearing and following the voice of God within it. You've seen that over and over with me. But there's a couple of verses in Hebrews that stood out to me in the course of my time in Hebrews over the last few months that spoke to me in particular about leadership particularly spiritual leadership. It's toward the end of the letter when the writer is giving some last instructions to the believers then. But in order for you to hear this, I need to take you back to high school physics class. How many of you uh, remember the term entropy from high school physics? Some of you, you'll remember it as I start to talk about it. It's related to the second law of thermodynamics. Entropy is basically this. You have water boiling on a stove. The water's boiling. It's bubbling away. You take it off the stove. It no longer has heat underneath it. The boiling subsides. The water begins to gradually lose heat. That's entropy. Entropy is basically this in a nutshell. Anything left to itself without some kind of energy and attention given to it, has a tendency to deteriorate. Entropy is what happens to a car when you don't start it for three or four weeks. You, a lot of times, you can't get it to turn over. Entropy is what happens to your husband when you leave him by himself for too long, unattended, you know. Entropy is what happens to your body. It's what happens to our work. It's what happens to our character. It's what happens to our health. It's what can happen to our finances when energy and attention is not given to them. It deteriorates. Entropy is what can happen in love between two people. I've taught in this church before. You know what you have to do to lose your marriage? Just do nothing. Do nothing and you can lose your marriage. There are hundreds of thousands of marriages that suffer and are broken by gradual entropy every year in America. And entropy can happen between a person and God. That there are times when your relationship with God can lose heat. It can lose energy. I'm chilled to the bone by the prayer of an ancient Christian writer who wrote these words. He said, God, forgive me for letting love die when it demands action in order to live. And so in the letter to Hebrews that we call Hebrews, one of the things that's being dealt with is a spiritual entropy has set in among believers. They're losing their fire. They're losing their heat. There's a spiritual malaise that settled in. I actually think that the letter to the Hebrews is a letter that fits the American church today and most believers in America. There's a spiritual malaise that settled over us in the country right now. And maybe you've even felt this way from time to time. And this is not, you're not the only generation that it happens to. There are places in scripture that I can take you where the people of God go through seasons of entropy. They lose their fire, they lose their heat. And Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, Jesus said that in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. Meaning, he says, in the last days, there are many believers. The love of many disciples will grow cold. In many ways, the letter that we call Hebrews is a letter to believers whose fire is waning. And so the writer of Hebrews, filled with the Spirit of God, comes along and gives some practical instructions at the end of the letter when it comes to reversing entropy in your life when it comes to bringing back the fire. And so for instance, in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, a pretty famous verse to some people, he comes along and he urges people, hey, don't give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. There were some even giving up that habit in the first century. He says, don't give up the habit of meeting together, but meet together so that you can spur one another on to love and to good works. Meeting together regularly does help to tend to your fire. The next time you're around a fire, later this winter, you're gonna get a fire in the fireplace and just notice the coals or embers in the fireplace or in the fire pit and just take a pair of tongs and remove one coal, remove one ember from that community of coals, set it off to the side in the corner of the fireplace and watch it lose its light. Watch it lose its heat. It happens. 
that if you want to burn, you can only burn by burning with others. There's something about meeting together regularly. Speaking of fire, then you get to the end of Hebrews 12, and the writer talks about our God, let us worship him, that, that tends the fire, with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming, say it with me, fire. And the practical instructions continue into Hebrews 13. I won't go to any of them, but just these in the midst of, of some of them. Hebrews 13, verses seven and eight. He says this, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And so in the context of talking to them about their waning fire, addressing their entropy, in the midst of all these instructions, he says, remember your leaders. Because the reality is, why, if you're a follower of Jesus, you will be a leader at certain times in your life. The flip side is also true. Every follower of Jesus needs leaders in their life. Amen. All of us do. But what, and, and the writer says, remember your leaders. Well, what kind of leaders? He goes on to define them, but I want you to know, they're not perfect leaders. You know this already. Second Corinthians 4, Paul reminds us, we have this treasure of the gospel in jars of clay. The jars have cracks in them. I like to say we're all crackpots. All of us are. God has no other choice but to work with broken vessels. That's the only ones he's got. But he does pour through them into our lives. And so there is such a thing as a lead follower, even in your life. And so there are phrases in this passage to where, that begin to define the kind of leaders that God is talking about here. Let's start with that last sentence because it's the bottom line, verse 8. He says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's the point of any worthwhile leadership. Jesus are the people who are following, being led to Jesus, to receive Jesus, to follow Jesus, to become like Jesus, to dream like Jesus, think like Jesus, act like Jesus, weep over what Jesus weeps about, pray about what Jesus prays about, have a passion for the things that Jesus has a passion about. Leaders will change from generation to generation. Jesus doesn't. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Jesus described in the Gospels. The Jesus expounded upon in the New Testament. The Jesus pointed to in the prophetic scriptures of the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus is the goal of all leadership and the standard by which any leadership should be evaluated. Jesus is our true north. This church is 117 years old. Leaders come and go. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And yet, having leaders in our lives is an indispensable part of following Jesus. This also has something to tell me about the kind of people we should allow to have influence in our lives. Do, do the people we esteem in our lives call our attention to Jesus? Do they follow Jesus? Do they help us want to follow Jesus? Do they help us become like Jesus? Because sometimes, even we as believers, esteem a lot of people who do nothing when it comes to pointing us to Jesus. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's to be the bottom line, the sum total of all leadership. Whether you're talking about the kind of leaders we're to seek to be, or the kind of leaders we're to look for in our lives. There are three more things, very quickly, the writer says about leaders that brings definition here. He says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you, verse seven. The writer defines a leader here, number one is one who spoke the word of God to you. Now Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, that it's out of the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. So if somebody's speaking the word of God to you, then that means they first have it in their heart. This is a person who has the word of God in their heart. I'm not talking about the capacity to quote chapter and verse. I'm talking about somebody who will speak the word of God to you, speak scripture to you. Who is that for you? It just flows out of them because it's in their heart. 
Who counsels you, speaks to you, refers you to the word of God? They may not quote chapter and verse, but they speak it. Psalm 119 reminds us that, that his word is a light into our path. God, God's word sheds light through them for you, in you, to you, on behalf of you. Who is it that just sheds light for you from time to time from the word of God? And on the other hand, who do you do that for? But it's more than just speaking it. They also live it, which leads to the next thing. Verse seven, consider the outcome of their way of life. Two things to note in this sentence. First of all, note the phrase, their way of life. These are people who have a way of life. They're living out the word of God. They're not just speaking it. And they've lived long enough that they have outcomes. That's the second thing I want you to note. That, that phrase, outcome. People are able to see some fruit in their life. They're able to see a quality of life. Now, it was Brennan Manning who lamented years ago that a lot of spiritual leaders are like travel agents passing out brochures and trying to get you to go to places that they themselves have never been. That's not the vision of leadership here. The vision of leadership here is, is there are people who've spoken the word of God to you and they have a way of life. They've lived long enough in light of the word of God. They have a way of life and they have outcomes from it. They've been to a few of the places that they're talking about. Most of you know what a barcode system is. You go to a grocery store, you buy an item, you take the item, you have to take the barcode, barcode and you have to run it over the scanner. The scanner sees the barcode and up pops on the register what it is you're buying and how much it costs. You go to a grocery store, you've picked up a bag of dog food, you take it to the self-checkout counter, you run the barcode over the scanner, up is supposed to pop Purina, dog chow, but every now and then there are mistakes made in the grocery industry. And sometimes people will put the wrong barcode on an item. You walk up with a bag of Purina dog chow, you take the label, you run it over the scanner at the self-checkout line and up pops Bluebell cookie two-step. <laughs> Half gallon. And the price of it, it's got a barcode that says Bluebell. But what you have is really dog food. Now, it was Dallas Willard who lamented this approach to Christianity. He called it barcode Christianity, where you have a lot of people in America that will run around and they go about their faith like it's a barcode. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I've made Jesus my Lord and Savior. Yeah, I'm a Christian. And they hold it up almost like an ID card. Yeah, I've done that. I've been there. I've done that. I've bought the T-shirt. But in reality, their quality of life in no way reflects their confession. Their barcode says Christian, but the content of their life says otherwise. They have no outcomes of joy or peace or patience or kindness or goodness or gentleness or faithfulness or self-control. They're just as fearful, they're just as anxious, they're just as angry, they're just as petty as much of the rest of the world. And consequently, no one really takes seriously what they have to say about Jesus. Why? Because in reality, they may have a barcode that says Christian, but they got a life that's dog food. That's not the kind of leader that the writer is talking about here. A spiritual leader is someone who's had outcomes for people to consider and observe. There's something about them that makes others want to lean in and ask, how did you get there? How did you come to see it that way? How in the world are you coping with this loss in that way? It's not all in life. If you see somebody you haven't seen in a year and they're 30 pounds lighter, what's your first question? What are you doing? You want to know what they're doing because you see an outcome that you like and you're dying to know what are you eating or how are you exercising? How did you get there? 
The kind of leader that Scripture is talking about here is somebody who has some outcomes, a way of life. Now, you can learn from a negative outcome in a leader's life as well, no doubt. In fact, there's a place for the leader sharing their negative outcomes and failures. Paul did. In order for others to know that the leader is saved by grace as well and is just as much of Jesus as everyone else. In fact, there are times when the leader is the display case for the power of the grace of God so that others know if God can do that for you, in you, and through you, then maybe he can do it with me. But there's also something to be said for considering some positive outcomes in another believer's life. Who is someone you know who's spoken the word of God to you and yet you've also over time seen them live something out of the word of God? They have a way of life that makes you think. You see some outcomes and you wanna lean in and ask, how did you get there? How did that happen? I was listening to our New campus pastor at the Farmer's Branch campus, Hunter Wheatcraft, talked the other day. He was just making the connection. He was talking about the importance of walking in his daily life. And when he goes for long walks, he prays. And he says, I've noticed this, that I have much greater control over my mouth on the days when I walk and pray for 40 minutes than the days when I don't walk and pray. What was he doing? He was connecting an outcome I've noticed about his life. He does have control over his mouth, but he was connecting an outcome with a way of life. And there's a relationship between one's way of life and outcomes. The kind of leader that scripture is talking about here is someone who people see an outcome and they're also noticing a way of life. Who is someone in your life that you've seen an outcome of sorts and it just makes you want to lean in and ask Tell me about that. And by the way, who might you be doing that for? Hopefully, all of us are doing that for someone, and maybe you don't realize it at the moment, but I pray God reveals it to you. But in order to see outcomes and consider ways of life, you have to be around people. That's why spending time together matters. That's why things like our life in small groups together, that's why things like celebrate recovery, embrace grace, things like serving together, that's why time together matters. Building relationships with one another because it's in the context of being together. We come to observe and consider and learn from one another's lives to celebrate outcomes, learn from outcomes be inspired by one another's ways of life. And I don't know about you, but when I see positive outcomes in the life of someone following Jesus, it stokes my fire to follow him and learn from that way of life. And that leads me to one final thing the writer says. The writer says this in verse seven, and imitate their faith. The leader has a faith worth imitating. What is faith? Go back and read Hebrews chapter 11 sometime for a full description. Faith is a conviction of things not seen. People of faith obey God when it costs them something. People of faith are more concerned with what God thinks than what anyone else thinks. People of faith love the way Jesus loves. Galatians 5 and verse 6, you know the only thing that counts? The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. All of us learn how to do something through imitation. You learn how to do bad things through imitation? That's the story of middle school and high school and college. And the truth is, that's a story of 40, 50, 60, and 70 year olds. They learn how to do bad stuff by imitating others, often the ones they esteem. You also learn how to do good stuff through imitation. Maybe this is why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, I gotta admit, I. I can't imagine myself saying that because I'm all too conscious of all the areas of my life in which I'm not yet like Christ. But having said that, I don't want to do a Jesus juke on Paul here because I'm sure Paul is very aware of his fallenness and his sins and his shortcomings. In fact, I know he is. I could show you other places in the New Testament. But Paul knew that when it comes to learning how to do anything, there's something to be said for doing as another does. We all need people in our lives that we can shadow. 
when it comes to learning how to walk in the light and live in the light of Jesus. I know of a team of new missionaries that relocated to Vietnam years ago to bring the gospel to an unreached quadrant of Vietnam. It was largely a jungle. They hired a native there in this part of Vietnam to guide them through the jungle from one location to another as they declared the gospel to people groups that had never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they came to a part of their journey where the the native of Vietnam, this Vietnamese man, literally has a massive machete and he's hacking his way through this dense jungle foliage and it seems like it's taking them forever to make progress and the missionaries begin to get nervous in a way that you can, in the way that I have out in the bush of Africa a time or two, where you're like, are we, do we really know where we are and where we're going? And I start to question the Vietnamese man about, is this, is there going to be a path soon? Are we going to find a path soon? And eventually the man just turned and in very broken English said, brothers, in this part of the jungle, I am the path. Now, I'm going to tell you what, it's a jungle out there. And there are times when you need a person to be your path, to help you find the way, the truth, and the life. If you're a parent, you're a path, whether you like it or not. The question is, where is your path leading? If you're a friend, a coworker, a teammate, you're a path for someone, where is that path leading? Because all of us are paths to someone. And when it comes to learning how to do anything, we learn through shadowing other people. Where is your path leading? May the answer be Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. Because all a leader really is, in Jesus' way of doing things, is a lead follower. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. I just want to give you a moment right now. I want you to thank God for someone who has spoken the word of God to you. And it may not be somebody who is even in an official role of leadership. It might have been a good friend, a spouse, a coworker. Thank God for someone who's spoken the word of God to you over the course of your life. And now I want you to think about someone else who's had an outcome or two in their life from following Jesus that you think, oh, I long for that in my own life. Maybe it was their sobriety. Maybe it was their self-control. Maybe it was their capacity to share their faith. Maybe it was their life being restored in some way. Think about somebody who has had an outcome that just made you want to lean in and ask, tell me more about that. Thank God for them. Maybe you need to text them today or drop them a note. Or if you're going to run into it later, specifically encourage them. They may need to hear it, how their life is spoken to you. While you're at it, think about somebody who's had a way of life that has just drawn you, that's just thought, well, I need more of that in my life. I need to adopt that rhythm of either rest or prayer or the capacity to to keep my head more in all situations or that capacity of spontaneous mercy. I don't know what it is, but a way of life that you've noticed in somebody. Thank God for them.
And Lord, we just say we want to be a path that leads to Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you for the lead followers in our life. We long to be lead followers ourselves. So crystallize our focus on you <laughs> to where we just see you as our instructor. And in due time, I do believe as we look around, there will be others who will notice an outcome because it's impossible for us to be in the sun and not bear the effects of the sun. It's impossible for us to be in your light and not reflect your light. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>